Please take your seats quickly, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you. Hi guys, welcome to OneMinuteTennis.com. Now today's forehand is often described as a whip-like motion, and this is a great description of it. But I want to delve deeper today into what that really means and where you initiate the whip-like motion actually from. So let's imagine that the racket is a whip and I'm now cracking or snapping the whip. Now different size whips will create significantly different forces. A very short whip will probably create no crack at all and distribute very little energy, whereas a longer whip or a very long whip will create a tremendous crack and it will actually impart tremendous force if it hits something. A bull whip is much more powerful and dangerous than a short whip. So when we're playing tennis, the distance between the end of the racket and the initiation of the stroke is essential in how much power we impart on the ball. Now there are limitations with this and the contact point with the ball is surely the limitation here. It's no point in me holding the racket by the tip here and making the longest possible motion because now I'll be so weak on contact, the racket will buckle and the ball will go anywhere. So our limitation at this end of the stroke is the contact point with the ball. So now let's look at how far away from that contact point I can actually initiate the stroke. Now there are many coaches that actually emphasize swinging from the hand because we have a lot of control from the hand. But now I have a very small kinetic chain, one or two links, and I'm initiating a whip-like motion that's this distance. Now let's go a little bit further back and we're gonna swing from the elbow. And when I swing from the elbow, I definitely start to get a whip-like feel. You'll do the same. So with the first one from the hand, nope, that was a feeling of pushing. But from this elbow position here, I start to get a whip-like motion. Now let's add another link of the chain and go another step further. And we're now going to swing from the right shoulder. And from the right shoulder, yep, now I can feel much more speed and I can hear the different sound that the racket is making. But we could go further. Surely the limitation is the left shoulder. And now if I swing from the left shoulder, I'm getting a whole rotation of the body and really I can feel and hear the racket whipping through the air and it's going to create more power and more spin. Combination of the two should give us control. But the pros do something else. The pros don't just initiate with the left shoulder, they actually externally rotate the left shoulder. Now, this is internal shoulder rotation where I come in, inside here and if I roll my racket back there, I've now made external shoulder rotation. So internal and external. And the way that they actually create this external shoulder rotation to begin the whip-like action in the extreme fashion as possible is to use the off hand, the left hand, and to spread the fingers and pull it into the shoulder. It's much easier to do this than to think of the shoulder because I'm very aware of what my hand is doing. And in the fraction of a second in the timing of the forehand, I'm not quite so aware of what my shoulders or the other parts of my body are doing. So now I begin the stroke here and my left hand is going to come into my shoulder with the fingers spread and wide and I make the stroke. And now I can feel much more speed. So again here into the shoulder and swing. Even the best players in the world have added this to their game. Novak Djokovic before 2011-12 his forehand was with this left arm passive down here. But since then, and since by no coincidence he's become the best player in the world by some margin, then his left hand comes up to the shoulder. All of the modern players, Alcaraz, Sinner, Medvedev, all of them, no matter what the style of their forehand, bring this left arm up to the left shoulder, initiating external shoulder rotation and extending and elongating the whipping motion of their forehand. Now there are different places for all of these movements. If I swing from the hand, then it will be when I'm in trouble, maybe half volleying or just trying to guide the ball into an empty space. I'll have a lot of control or very little power. Swinging from the elbow is often made when I'm making a passing shot or on the run, or for a return of serve. Swinging from the right shoulder is a ground stroke where you're really trying to play safe. But for the most power, for the best stroke, for the best and almost optimum outcome, then you want to be swinging from the left shoulder and you want to externally rotate that shoulder by using the left hand. I hope this makes sense, and if you like my ideas, check out our other services. 
We provide a unique online coaching service with a combination of video analysis and then personalized one-to-one -one training such as this. And also we have a full range of books on Amazon. We cover every part of the game, including the biomechanics, the science, and then really simple solutions such as this. Our latest book is online now, The Power Solution. So use the length of the whip in the appropriate situation. For the control position, just swing from the hand. For the safer position, swing from the elbow. For more power, start to initiate the right shoulder. And for the ground stroke, when you're comfortable and hitting the ball freely, then make sure you use external shoulder rotation. Draw the left shoulder back and you'll have more power, more speed and more spin on your forehand. And it's easier. Thanks for watching and see you next time for more unique tennis lessons that really work.